Rachel, if I had known you in the 30s and the 40s, when you were growing up, what was your perception of America as a whole in terms of how the world treated the African American? When we were growing up, we were, what they was conveyed to us is that we were inferior and that we were um, lazy, um, not seeking a better life. Uh, discrimination was, was rampant then and, uh, and very open. Uh, when we were kids, we went to the neighborhood theater and they would uh, direct us to the balcony. We didn't even understand why we were directed to balcony until we got a little older, but that was the nature of segregation. So it was very rampant in, in, my, in my childhood uh, times. Did you feel it? I felt it, but you know, my father and mother had, had been so specific about who we were, what we could do, the positive aspects of our culture, that I had a way to fight off those, um, those impressions that people had. Mm -hmm. I didn't take them into me. I didn't say, oh, I'm inferior, so I should hide behind something. Mm -hmm. Or um, I shouldn't aspire to, to, to be anything special. Mm -hmm. I, my father said, you're going to college, and I'm going to help you get there. He did say that. Absolutely. He raised the, my first tuition at UCLA from his buddies in, in the, in the uh, Veterans Corps. Wow. And why nursing, Rachel? Why nursing? Oh, my mother was, um, we, had, we had a wonderful family doctor. And um, our whole family depended on him, and he took care of all of us. He was extraordinary. Uh, between his influence and my mother's influence, who my mother worshipped the medical field, the nursing field. So I knew that's where I was going, because I was trying to please them and initially. I was trying to please them. And when I got into it, I felt like it was right for me. This is where I belong. I want to quote from your book. And for people who may not know the story, um, and you'll tell me if I get it basically right, Jackie Robinson goes to UCLA. He's a four-letter man. The war starts. By the way, it's interesting. He is playing for a, minor league, uh, for a uh, Negro team, and they're visiting Hawaii. And he's in Hawaii on December 5th, 1941. He leaves on December 5th. And of course, on December 7th, 1941, we have Pearl Harbor. Right. He then in, he enlists in the Army with some friends. He serves in the Army. You know, If we had all the time in the world, we'd talk about his interesting experiences in the Army. He comes out of the Army, and he's going to play ball. And ultimately, he plays first for the Kansas City Monarchs, which is a great team from the Negro League with Satchel Paige, et cetera. Yeah. And then ultimately, as I described, he is signed by the Brooklyn Dodger organization, and he is going to go with you to your first spring training in Daytona, Florida, to play for the Montreal Royals, their minor league baseball team. You write about what it's like heading with your husband to Daytona for the first spring training, and this is what you write that you had an unguarded faith in being American, although I did have, you write, some trepidation about entering the South for the first time. And when I read it, I said to myself, isn't that interesting? You're really a California girl mm -hmm. who knows what the South is, although you've never experienced it. When you write about being <laughs> You have unguarded faith in America. It's such an interesting phrase. Rachel, what do you mean? An unguarded faith in America as a 22, 23, 24, 25 year old girl. Being um, unguarded means I was open to, um, to the values and the, the strengths of, of the American society. And so I was kind of protected by that, I thought. Uh, and so going south, they were, I knew there were going to be attacks on us and attacks on our, us, our race, on, on our feelings, on our um, movements. Um, but I didn't want it to change the way I dealt with things. I, I knew I could manage it because I felt I'm an American and I have rights 
and uh, and I am a good person. And so uh, it was startling to me, though, when I got to, to Daydon, when we were bumped from two planes before we got worse, there. It was worse than you had anticipated. Much worse than I thought it would be. Uh, more blatant, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, attacks on us in terms of are just being taken off of two airplanes and told to wait. And we were trying to get to spring training on time, and so it was very tense and very urgent for me. Uh, the only way I, I, one little way that I tried to uh, deal with it is uh, I walked into the white lady's bathroom. Yes, you did. And I held my head up and I went in there, did my business, and looked at the ladies and walked out. And I felt better. I felt, res you know, respect for myself and uh, restored. My confidence was restored. In L.A., were there white and black segregated restrooms? Uh, no. So this, this was your first this experience. This was the first experience with segregation. Yes. With signs on the water fountains, uh, signs on the restroom, uh, not being able to eat in the restaurant in the in the airport. Uh, so Jack and I decided we wouldn't eat if we. They wanted us to come to the back door and take sandwiches out, we wouldn't do it. And the funny part was that Mally, Jack's mother, having all these experiences in the South, had given us a box of fried chicken before we got onto the plane. And we were a little embarrassed because we thought the chicken smelled and then Mally didn't know, you know, we were going to be fed on the plane and all. we ate every bit of that fried chicken. It turned out in the end you needed it. And we needed it. Yes. And we needed it. Yes. You write very movingly about that. You write about one other event that I want you to recall from me. You're on the way to spring training and American Airlines bumps you and they bump you again. And in the end, you have to take a bus. Mm -hmm. And when you take the bus, you and Jack get on the bus. It's pretty empty at the time. You sit up front. Mm -hmm. Jack falls asleep. The bus fills up. And the bus driver then wakes him, or tells you to wake him, and says, you must now move to the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. And again, I know there are many people watching who do not understand the history of Jackie Robinson. But one of the things that was true about him was he had a passion for the rights of his people. And he had a temper, and he could express himself. And very often, he took on the establishment when he felt, as you felt, you were going to go into that white bathroom, mm -hmm. even though it said whites only. And he was known for standing up for himself and his people. And you write, however, that on this bus trip, when he's awakened, there's a moment when you wonder whether he's going to make a scene. And instead, he takes you to the back of the bus where there are other Negroes waiting, and you spend the rest of the trip with that. And you write that you weep silently mm -hmm. because you felt at that moment something had been taken from your husband. Now, it turned out, by the way, nothing was taken from him. But I want you to try to remember what that moment was like for you and how you place it. In other words, if I had met you that day, what did it tell you about America? What did it tell you about the experience you were about, you were about to enter? Jack was court-martialed in the Army for refusing to go to the back of a bus. So he'd had that experience. So when this driver came up to us and said we had to move to the back of the bus when we were on the streets, I was afraid that Jack might res respond in some angry way and get us into trouble. And the goal was to get to spring training. The goal was not to let anything interfere with that. So, um, he, and he understood that and he just kind of uh, agreed and, and walked to the back. And, and then I started to cry because I thought, I felt they had reduced the man to a boy. And that was the, attempt in segregated situations is to uh, take away your, your strengths, your confidence, your belief in yourself. And I felt they had done that to him when he was so complacent about going to the back of the bus. Did you talk to him about it? No. I was very protective of him. 
And uh, I didn't want him to see me suffering or feel that I was suffering because we had uh, a lot of challenges ahead of us. Ultimately, he goes to Montreal. He is a huge success in Montreal. He has a great first game. Ultimately, he helps the team win the little, league, the little World Series, whatever it was called. And you, for the first time, it seems, become aware of what his playing baseball might mean on a larger level. And that what you wrote was, we were beginning to understand this was more than just a job opportunity. And that, you know, this is so real, Rachel. For, in retrospect, there's history being made. At the time, you're a young, newly married wife. You're going to have a child in the following year. Jack has to earn a living. And playing baseball was his livelihood. And so in some way, I could understand both of you seeing this as a job. But at the same time, you write, do you begin to understand that there's something more going on here? To what extent did you have a clue of what was really happening when you got the call from Jack in August of 1945 that he was being tapped as the first African-American baseball player. At what point in your life inside you do you begin to understand that this is so much bigger than the two of you and that at the same time it is on the two of you, it is your shoulders that are going to have to carry this. Do you understand what I'm asking you? At what point do you really become aware of the greater significance of what history has thrust upon you as a human being, as again this 20-something year old young woman? Uh, we did not um, appreciate that early on. We were very uh, caught up in our own relationship, making that work. Um, we had decided that I had to finish college and Jack had to get a job before we could get married, so those were, those were our own goals. And so we were very um, focused on what was going on between us. And we loved each other just so passionately that we thought we could do it, that as a couple, we could do anything if we were together. At some point when we got out of the initial settings, went to Montreal, went to Daytona Beach, went to other places, and we could see that people were being treated, mistreated by um, the segregation policies and by the attitudes toward them. We began to see that our mission was larger than just Jack getting a job and, and us being a good uh, wedded couple. How did it make you feel? It made you feel uh, almost responsible in some ways. Um, we, we've got to do this not just for us but for others. Um, will, will our success uh, translate into some change, we hoped? Uh, you, you have hopes and fears and you have you know, very mixed feelings about being in that situation because you're not sure that you're really up to it, that you really can manage it, or that you can do anything about segregation, which was a huge thing. Um, but um, you begin to think, what can we do within our own circle, within our own environment, and then will that translate into something change? change? We, Mr. Ricky and Jack and I talked about that, like with that, if he succeeded, did that mean the door was open in baseball? And if baseball, if the door was open in baseball, why not in other uh, areas? So it was kind of a, a thing that was, came on us gradually and that we took on gradually when we were able to. But did you ever resent it? I, yes, of course I resented it. I resented the way we were being treated when I understood it better, um, that the limited opportunities that we had were, um, were being dictated by the, by the attitudes toward us. Um, yes, I resented it, but again, you know, anger and resentment can undermine your own spirit and your own ability to, to move forward. And so we were always moving forward. 
the meeting in August with Branch Rickey is described in many ways, and your husband wrote this wonderful book, I Never Had It Made, in which he describes in very wonderful detail the conversation that he had with Branch Rickey and the now famous line, I need someone with the guts not to fight back. Mm -hmm. And Jackie's instinct was to fight back, and Branch Rickey was saying to him, you must be strong enough that no matter what they hurl at you and your family, you're not going to fight back for at least two years. That was the deal. First of all, is that story true? That story is true, as far as I know. I wasn't sitting there. Okay, but that's the way you... <laughs> that's Jack, the way Jack okay. told it to me. I, you know, to the extent to which you can remember, by the way, you just celebrated your 90th birthday. Yes, sir. Mazel tov to you. Thank you. So you have a right to say I don't remember anything I ask you, <laughs> but... What was his reaction when he came home and said to you, I've been told I can't fight back for two years. Was it something he was willing to accept easily? Did he ever say to himself, I, or to you, I don't know if I can do it? Did you worry that he had made this commitment? No, I, um, he did not say he couldn't do it. Um, at that point, there was a certain amount of desperation in, in, in his life because he had to find a, himself in a profession. This was a great opportunity. He wasn't going to blow it by uh, being angry or getting into fights or doing anything that would make it, uh, make it difficult to carry forward. So it was, um, he had to think about how. how we, Jack was a very religious person and he talked to God all the time on his knees. And he really believed that God was going to work with him, help him, support him, love him. And he, that was, I think, a great part of his uh, strength. That it came from Mally, of course, uh, his mother, uh, because she, as a sharecropper, she had had the same kind of strength and, and had to move ahead even against all kinds of obstacles. But um, he thought he could do it. And then Branch Rickey's attitude was such that he invited Jack as a partner. He never said, you have to do it, we have to do it. And that made a big difference to him. You describe, every, well, this is described in many, by many people in many ways, the vitriol that he had to face. You got death threats. The first couple of years were very hard on you, including insults that were hurled at you, not only from the stands, but from other ball players, Even Jackie's teammates at times, they threatened not to play with him, they were gonna quit, and boycott. When they slid in, they were trying to hurt him. Some pitchers tried to hit him in the head. I mean, again, we now take for granted that there are all races in Major League Baseball but we have to remember, there was only whites playing until your husband stepped on a professional baseball field and then pre, you know, became a Brooklyn Dodger. Mm -hmm. At any point along the way, did you ever lose hope? Did he ever lose hope? Did he ever say to you, I, I wish, if, if, I'd ha if I had a magic wand, I would change this whole thing, did you ever, ever say to yourself, we never should have done this? Never. We never said that. Because there are always um, positive elements that you can look for. And for instance, black people started coming to the ball games. And though they were segregated in the seating arrangements, we could look down the, down the field and we could see them nodding, waving, you know, rejoicing. Uh, that was a source of, of um, strength for us and a source of um, commitment. Uh, we also had in each of the, everywhere we moved to, we had a family, a black family, that would come forward and say, come to our house for Sunday dinner. Uh, call us if you need us. We'll babysit for you. I mean, there were things coming into us that were positive. So that it, it enabled us to uh, ignore uh, to some extent, uh, can't really ignore totally, but some of the attacks that were coming. 
we got hate mail. We got one situation where they said they were going to shoot him from the stands. We, you know, you have to be fearful about that. But the only real fear I had, too, one was that the, one of those pitchers were going to hit him in the head. And, and, I, and I really worried about him getting hurt physically. And the other one is that somehow it would affect his play and then he would be out of the game. And I thought he was so important to that team that they couldn't play without him, couldn't win without him. They couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm also a baseball fan. Talk to me for a moment about what it was like for you being with the Dodgers of the late 40s and the early 50s. And there's a story, and I'm assuming it's true. I mean, I've seen pictures of it that one of the important moments for Jackie's relationship with the team had to do with a moment with Pee Wee Reese, who was a shortstop and the captain, and Jackie started at first base, then moved to second base, and was one of baseball's greatest second basemen. But there's a moment described, Rachel, that at one point, Pee Wee Reese, at a time when people are heckling very much from the stands, comes over and puts his arm around your husband. Is that story true, and do you remember it? The story is true. I feel that too much is made of it. Um, that Pee Wee was a good guy and he was from Kentucky and the fact that he could relate to Jack in a positive way was really important to us. But um, I think people, Pee Wee got as much out of that relationship as Jack did and I don't think that comes across when you just talk right. about how he put his hand on his shoulder and like saved him or something. I have a picture, I wanted people to see the picture where Jack and Pee Wee are coming off the field and they happen to be walking very close by and their hands touch. I wanted that picture to be shown because it was a mutual thing. He got as much out of it as Jack did, even though we were very pleased that he gave leadership in the team so the other fellows could come toward Jack. In general, were the Dodgers welcoming of him once we got past that initial phase? It, I would say in general, yes, at, at different levels. Some just, you know, high, yep. and some said, you know, this is how you catch a ball on first base. You know, some are, were, were uh, closer than others. But uh, generally speaking, he was comfortable with the team. And Branch Rickey had uh, traded the ones who were most vocal about mm -hmm. not wanting to play with Jack. Mm -hmm. So they weren't on the team at the time he played. Mm -hmm. Were you a baseball fan? Yourself. No, I was not a baseball fan. <laughs> in college, we never went to a single baseball game. Uh, we, it was football and basketball were the games. So I had a lot to learn about uh, the game. And Jack was a good teacher in terms of strategy because he thought a lot about strategy. And uh, so I tried to catch up and understand what, what was important, what were the plays about, uh, so that we could discuss it, you know? So. Permit me to ask you a couple of things just so you free associate. 1951, the, the, the home run hit heard around the world when Bobby Thompson hits the home run in the mm -hmm. final playoff game. Yeah. Where were you and what was that day like for Jackie Robinson? Uh, <laughs> I was in the stand were you? when it happened. Uh, it was almost unbelievable because we were so tense and so excited about that game and that game was so important to us. We could see ourselves getting closer to the championship. Um, we just had to uh, live with it as one of those major disappointments that you have in life and um, we, didn't, we didn't get over it for, for weeks. We were talking, kept talking about it. What if we'd done this? What if we'd done that? Um, but we were all um, really upset by that um, and not celebrating the, the fact that he hit it. <laughs> yes. You understand that for us who are fans, we often have a romanticized notion of what it's like for the ball player himself. Very few fans ever say to themselves, it's their job. People go to their job. And by the way, you work in an office. There are many people who are around you. You know them, you like them, you say hello to them. You may have no social interaction with them once you leave the office. And in baseball teams travel together, that's true. 
but very often times you have your life. You go to the ballpark to play a game. Mm -hmm. That's your job. The game is over. You go home. Right. Were there any ball players as part of the Dodgers who became important to you off the field? A few. Um, we did not socialize with the teammates that much. And I would say Gil Hodges and his wife Joan and Carl Erskine and his wife and uh, Pee Wee and Dottie uh, were probably the three that we saw the most of. Now we also had Don Newcomb and we had uh, Roy, Campanella. Uh, Roy Campanella, the black players who came in. And, uh, but we weren't invited to their uh, homes for parties and we never invited them to our homes. Mm -hmm. We had meals with the ones I mentioned occasionally but it was uh, it was like a, a business you know exactly. it was a business ra relationship and how about the relationship with the opposing teams and again when you were a Brooklyn Dodger fan you hated the Giants <laughs> and you hated Leo DeRocher and you know for me who a passionate Jackie Robinson fan I was very upset with the way the Giants treated him and there was the incidents with Davey Williams at first base and Leo DeRocher in general. Was the fan experience of the rivalry between the Dodgers and the Giants the same for you? Oh, they were the enemy. They of were. Of course. Just like the Yankees <laughs> became the enemy when in other situations. Yes. They in the World Series. Mm -hmm. And so you could hate them and it was okay. Uh, and that's part of being a, a fan, is to have your loyalty to your team and your love of your team and your, all of your aspirations are connected to your team, but you didn't want anything good to happen to your enemy. Outside the game, does, do you and Jackie Robinson ever become friendly with Ball players who were on the other were a Giants or a Yankee. No, no, that didn't happen. It, did it only happen. happened then after he retired. After he retired. Okay, yes. very yes. very interesting. Okay, Rachel, your life has not been easy. You have always maintained a grace and dignity, but your life has not been easy. And as successful as Jackie Robinson's career was, as thrilling as it was. They were very, very hard, hard times for you. And you've had hard experiences as a human being in life as a whole. And you write about the chapter on how you lost your oldest son, Jackie Jr., who was killed in a car accident on the Merritt Parkway. And how you understand none of us who are parents can ever, I mean, I just want to hug you to death. I mean, I'm so sorry. I don't know how you lose a child and keep going. I don't know how. And you write very movingly about that. Jackie comes down with a serious illness and uh, has to deal with that in life. And then he dies very, very, very young. And you have a long life after he dies. And you had to build your own life and your own home. And we talked about them when you were living in Stanford at the time. I ended up a rabbi in Stanford. And you had this wonderful home, and you had these jazz festivals, and everybody was at your home, and it was wonderful, and then it's gone. And I wanted to know where the strength comes, and whether you can talk at all about how a human being endures and transcends the kinds of pain you've had to live with at times in your life. I... Uh I actually feel very blessed. I feel that, um, yes, I've had to live with tragedy and with loss and with really terrible things. But also, I've had experiences that, and relationships that have made me uh, ready for what was coming. Um, I, I passionately love Jack, and I felt always felt that God, this is this is uh, this is so wonderful, and it did something for both my spirit and for my sense of myself because I felt adored by him, and uh, that I also had that feeling from my parents. Uh, Rachel 
can do anything. Do, you know, get going and do it. So there was a lot of uh, structure, a lot of um, strength that came from my relationships. Um, we, we suffered through, my mother, Jackie Jr. died in 71, Jack died in 72, and my mother died in 73. It was the worst period of my life. And I didn't know that I could really come out of that. I really just went down for a short period of time. But it was a short period of time because I knew I had to get up and get going, you know, somehow, somehow. And that's when we founded the Jackie Robinson Foundation. We, my friends and I said, what can we do to uh, keep Jack's legacy alive? And if we work on that, maybe we'll feel uh, better. We'll be, feel closer to him. And so that's how that, uh, the organization began and how I recovered as we began to help these young people get educated. Mm -hmm. We should mention, by the way, you have two other children who are very successful in their own right. Mm -hmm. Sharon followed your example as in nursing, mm -hmm. and your son David is in Africa? Yeah, Tanzania, Africa. And incidentally, there are times when you also have yourself wanted to, in some way, identify with and strengthen the ties of the African American community here to your African roots. Do I have that right? Yes. So you must be proud of both of your children. That's, I'm very that's, that's proud very, of them. Lovely. I'm very proud of them. Sharon has also become an author. She's a children's book author. Oh, how lovely. And she's uh, published six books. And they're uh, really interesting books. And children are writing to me about the books that Sharon. And David has start, started a coffee cooperative in his village in Tanzania. Amazing. He has 400 small farmers who pool their coffee. He uh, imports it to the United States, has it processed here, and they sell it here. Money goes back to the, the, the uh, co-op. So both of them are in wonderful positions and also still following sort of the family tradition of giving back. You must, it must make you very proud. I am very, very proud, proud of them. Can I ask, did you and Jackie have any feelings about the Jewish community? And I ask you that because uh, you write how one of, I believe I've got this right, in 1949, you have your first two-bedroom apartment mm -hmm. on Tilden Avenue in Brooklyn, and you meet the Satlows, and you talk about Archie and Sarah and their three children. Mm -hmm. You also talk about how at Grossinger's, you become very good friends with B and Andre Baruch. Mm -hmm. And then in Stanford, you write about Andrea Simon, and you also talk about how when Jack died, it was Sidney Queskin who came over and helped you. And, mm -hmm. and the Queskins, of course, have created wonderful things in Stanford. And they have the Queskin Theater, where I've been privileged to perform. Um, in general, did you find support in any way, or did the Jewish community, did you feel, give the revolution you were trying to create support? In what way did you feel that the Jewish community either was or was not supportive of enough of Jackie Robinson in particular and the civil rights movement in general? Uh, I can't, I don't know that I can talk about the Jewish community per se, but I've always had very good Jewish friends and they've been extremely important to me. Marty Edelman, who is my best friend right now, uh, has been with me for the last 20 some years. Uh, Sarah, the, the Simrites, she's 93 years old, living in Florida. <laughs> she and I are still close. Uh, as individuals, uh, I love them and they love me and we were strengthened. Uh, I always felt that the Jewish people had similar experiences to mine. And so there was no uh, difference there in that sense that uh, we know that they're going through some of the same things we're going through. They will understand me better and uh, I can uh, really understand them. And they, they've, they've come to my rescue when we moved to Tilden Avenue. Uh, Sarah and her husband came over. They, there was some kind of document being circulated to keep us out of the neighborhood. And Sarah came over and introduced herself to me and said, listen, we're in the neighborhood and we're uh, with you on this. And of course, it was mutual because I was very excited to have her uh, come forward and to offer her help. So it's, um, 
for me, it's been um, close ties with the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened in your home in Stamford, you met with some of the most wonderful leaders of the African American community. You knew them all. They all turned to Jack. And so there were so many times you were in the presence of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, you know, any picture book, your book is a wonderful book on Jack Robinson, you see picture after picture of our nation's leading African American figures. I want you to remember now, you know, the early 60s. Jackie Robinson is out of baseball and he is now a leader on the American scene. He's with the NAACP and the Civil Rights Act has not been passed yet. It's the early 60s and Medgar Evers is killed and then Schwerner, Goodman and Cheney are killed and ultimately there is an attempt by the African American community to create a real civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. May I ask you what that was like for you and whether you can also talk about what it was like being with people like Martin Luther King? It was inspiring because you had black leadership that you could have confidence in and you had plans. There were really plans for how to create change. Uh, Jesse Jackson was one of my friends and it still is. And when Jesse stood up and spoke up and defended us and fought for us, uh, it was very exciting for us. And when Martin Luther King, uh, he, was, uh, he was just our hero, he was our leader, he was our, um, he was our, our mentor in many ways. He, he taught us how to address some of these problems. So we had, we were surrounded not just by white leaders, but by black leaders who were able to do that. And uh, I think that uh, 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 President Barack Obama is sitting on the pinnacle of that, of that uh, period and those people and all their uh, productions. How is America doing now, Rachel, in terms of racism? I think we've seen major change. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and we've been a part of the major change, but there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, we, don't, we, we don't have equal opportunities. We don't have um, places for even children who are being educated. There's still a, a discriminatory factor in that. Um, so we, have, we cannot uh, sit tight and say uh, everything's okay because we need uh, major change still. And it's not just uh, around women, but it's also around black people. Mm -hmm. If you had the chance to affect American social policy in any way, is there one thing you would like to see us do first? Job opportunities and education. I think that uh, our people need to be educated and, and be ready to assume a, a positions and, and, and uh, profession, be in professions and affect the change and um, the uh, job opportunities have to be there for people who are ready to assume those positions and we're not there yet. We have to begin to wrap up so I want to just ask you to come back now to, to who Jackie Robinson was as a human being. Again there are many many stories about how he had a fighting spirit and I want to know, if I was in your home on a daily basis, if I had been lucky enough to be part of your circle, what would I have experienced of him as a person? Was he, in general, as gentle a person as I perceived him to be? Was he, in general, gentle? not only in his demeanor, which is the only thing I ever experienced, and when I experienced him personally, he was always lovely and gentle. Or if I knew him better, would I describe him differently? What was the texture and tone 
of Jackie Robinson? The thing that attracted, uh, I loved the most about him when I first met him, I thought he was going to be arrogant. He was a big man on campus and uh, four sport letterman and all those things. The thing that attracted me to him was the humility that he exuded. And that was him. There was an humbleness to him. There was a warmth to him. There was a loving side of him. That anger and all that that people talk about was in competition. When he's on a field, you, all the sweetness went away. He's going to win. But when he was at home, he was very loving, gentle, um, approachable, and uh, involved with us, with the children, with us as a family, and very protective of us. He, um, he was um, interested in other people and, and interested in, in all of our activities. As we talk a lot, we do a lot of things together, Camp, went camping together, we do go vacationing together. Uh, those things were always fun. He did, I never heard him use a profane word in our household, and yet I heard Red Barber, uh, not Red Barber, one of these sports columnists said how profane Jack was in the clubhouse, but we never heard that at home. And he felt home was a haven, and he wanted to keep it that way. And so he contributed a lot to the peacefulness of the, of the home. Was he a good father? He was a good father. He was very busy and he always wished he had more time with the kids and he talked about that a lot. But he was a good father. He loved them, he watched them, he instructed them and he did as much with them as he could. So I want to come back to one of the first questions. I said to you, did you understand what was happening to you when you started this journey and you honestly said, I really didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Over the sweep of his career, his 10-year baseball career, and then he was traded to the New York Giants <laughs> after the 1956 season. I was devastated. I was so glad he retired rather than play <laughs> for the Giants. Are you kidding me? And then he has a very successful career after baseball. And he becomes Jackie Robinson, the man who broke the color, color barrier. And I believe, well, people don't realize, in, when Jackie was, when Jackie was uh, signed by Branch Rickey, the United States military was segregated. Yes. Harry Truman desegregates after Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. So much of what America becomes, it becomes because there was a man who had the guts not to, not to fight back and then the ability on the baseball field to be a star. And again, I wish everybody had seen how electric he was on the base pads and how wonderful a competitor he was and, and how wonderful a fielder he was. <laughs> but he became Jackie Robinson. And you know, Rachel, when a social movement needs a person, chooses a person to do something revolutionary, it's an enormous responsibility. That person can't fail or the movement fails. So I now ask you, as you look back over the sweep of who he was and you were with him, it was the two of you. In retrospect now, do you appreciate what the two of you did? I am proud of what we were able to do and what we were uh, supported in doing. Um, Jack, neither Jack nor I ever felt like we were uh, movers and shakers or big time anything. Uh, we were doing what came naturally to us. Uh, we were doing what we uh, wanted to do, what we'd been taught was important. And I'm, we, were, we had good spirit and we grew and we, we developed as a part of this experience. So it all came back to us in very positive ways. That's lovely. Yes. You know, you have known many celebrities, and I have been fortunate enough to know many celebrities. Very often celebrity changes a person and not in a lovely way. It never seemed to affect either your husband no, or you. It didn't. That's a tremendous compliment to you. No. 
so I want you to know something. In the Jewish tradition, yeah. there's something called the High Holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Ten days of awe. They are the most solemn days in the Jewish mm -hmm. year. And there are services at synagogues all over the world celebrating these holidays. And the last day, Yom Kippur, includes something called the Martyrology, in which the Jewish people remember a group of ancient rabbis who were martyred mm -hmm. because they wanted to be Jews. And there are many synagogues now which expand the, quote, martyrology to include those over history who have given of themselves mm -hmm. for the betterment of the world and society and humanity. And that my services, in my martyrology, we often read passages from individuals who are both Jewish and not Jewish, the not-Jewish are those who have made a contribution to humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I want to read to you now a passage that is read at my congregation mm -hmm. on the High Holidays. Okay. Life, in spite of all its ups and downs, has been very good to me individually. Why then do I insist that I never had it made? It is because I refuse to kid myself about the value of having a comfortable home, about having a little money in the bank, about having received rewards and trophies and honors. A life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. I cannot possibly believe I have it made while so many of my brothers and sisters are hungry, inadequately housed, insufficiently clothed, denied their dignity as they live in slums. I cannot say I have it made while our country drives full speed ahead to deeper rifts between men and women of varying colors, speeds along a course toward more and more racism. I cannot as an individual rejoice in the good things I have been permitted to work for and learn while the humblest of my brothers is down in a deep hole, hollering for help and not being heard. I owe. Some of my friends tell me I've paid the note a thousandfold, but I still owe. Till every man can rent and lease and buy according to his money and his desires. Until every child can have an equal opportunity in youth and adulthood. Until hunger is not only immoral but illegal until hatred is recognized as a disease, a scourge, an epidemic, and treated as such, until racism and sexism and narcotics are conquered, and until everyone can vote and anyone can be elected if one qualifies, until that day, Jackie Robinson, nor anyone else, can say he has it made. That's from your husband's book. I know, I know. And that was Jack. That was your husband. That was Jack. And I hope I am not being presumptuous. He is writing for you too, is he not? Oh, absolutely. Only he's, he does it with more fluency. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very proud of, of that, of his statement, because I saw him live that and to believe in, in those values and those goals for our, for our race and for our country. He was a great American, you understand. Mm. He was a great African-American, but he was a great American. Mm. And uh, I'll tell you one more quick story. And I told this story also at my high holiday services. I was maybe I would get somewhere around 10 years old. And my parents take, my father takes me to a, a men's club meeting 
from my synagogue. And we're having a speaker. And I'm not told who the speaker is. It turns out to be Jackie Robinson, your husband. Mm. Well, when I find this out, I am in heaven. I'm going to meet my idol. And I remember we get there early and I'm waiting in the driveway of this restaurant where your husband's coming to speak. And he drives up in a car. And to my shock, he's not wearing a Dodger uniform. I don't know why. I mean, in my <laughs> mind, he was always wearing a Dodger uniform. And we come in, and, and I get to sit in the booth with your husband. And, I'm mm. a, and the men are talking to him, and I get to ask your husband questions. And he's very lovely to me. And we go into the dinner, and he speaks. And I sit at the dinner, and now the dinner is over. And he's, he was a wonderful success, and it was a wonderful evening. And he, he gets up. As he's standing, he moves from behind the dais, and the room stands up. All these men at this, at this restaurant tables, and they all gather around, and they're walking your husband out the door. Mm. And I'm in the back. I'm a little boy. And at the top of my lungs, I call out, Don't forget me. Hmm. And... Those, again, who know Jackie Robinson, he had a very distinctive voice. He had a lovely, sweet, high voice. voice. Everybody laughs. Don't forget me. The room laughs as they're exclaiming. And over the laughter comes this high-pitched voice. I won't. Lovely. And I believe that expresses... Your husband didn't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. uh, he was out the door. Well, kid in the back of the room, don't forget me. Mm -hmm. He could have just walked out. No, I won't. I believe, incidentally, it is one of the kindest things a person can do for another. I won't forget you. Yeah. It is the meaning of the Jewish High Holidays, mm -hmm. remembering. Remembering, yes. And I told that story because I believe it is what we want to be. Mm -hmm. So much of what you and your husband were are what we want to be. And you have to hear that. And I hope people tell that to you every day. What you and your husband have been are what we want to be. And that's a gift that I hope you understand you and he together have given that will be forever. And I want to end by reading something you wrote. All right. This is after you are thrown off the American Airlines plane at the beginning of your journey on the way to your first spring training for the Montreal Royals in Daytona, Florida. Rachel, Annetta, Isam Robinson writes, From the moment we were bumped from American airline flights, my role unfolded, evolved, and became more crucial over time. You wanted to protect your husband, although you wrote it was really impossible. But you did want to witness and validate realities, love without reservation, share his thoughts and miseries, find humor in the ridiculous behavior against us, and help maintain our fighting spirit. Rachel, were you able to do it? All I can say is I tried. And to some extent, I feel I succeeded, but it's only because I had a mate, because the two of us worked on it in just those ways. And particularly the, the humor, we saw some of the, uh, in, the, some of the, the activities against us were so outrageous that we were able to make fun of them and go on uh, doing what we were doing. I want to just say that as a fan, you are very impressive, and I, I, you bring back so much for me to remember and to think about, 
and I still wrestle with some of those questions you ask today. Um, but I know when I see our students uh, every year, they come to New York once a year for networking weekend, and uh, they come up to me and talk to me about their experiences. I know that we're, we are uh, continuing to uh, help develop another group and that somehow the love and strength and the thoughts that we give to what we are doing for them. Uh, it's not just the money and wishing them well. It's uh, being close to them and mentoring them and wanting them to be leaders and to follow in Jack's path. You know, I told you, I've loved you from afar my entire life. Sometimes you look forward to meeting somebody in the public eye and they disappoint you. You have not disappointed me. You are as wonderful in person as I've ever imagined. You are not only the first lady of baseball, and you have, you have and continue to occupy in a very important role in America. You are an American treasure. But now that I've met you, I love you very, very dearly, and I wish you 120 and then some, and only success and happiness for you, your children, your grandchildren. How many grandchildren? 16. 16. <laughs> I wish you, your children, and your grandchildren success in everything you and they do, Thank happiness, you. long life, and maybe there'll be other opportunities for you and for me to sit together. But I thank you very much. I have to give you a hug. Oh. I love you thank very you much. Thank you so much. Mm. You're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Wonderful. Rachel Robinson. I hope you've enjoyed meeting her as much as I have. If you want to be in touch with Rachel, you can do so by emailing me, and I will forward your emails on to her. You know, I always say, if you have any thoughts or comments, be in touch with me. I don't care. <laughs> this is just a moment for me. That's what I'm just going to say. Thank you, darling. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Until the next time, I'm Mark Gollum. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. Lachaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.